Uh, If you have a Bible, you're going to need it, and you should turn to the book of Titus, which for some of us, that's going to take the whole time, pretty much, finding. It's It's in the New Testament. It's toward the back. I think if you've hit Hebrews, you've gone too far. All right, Titus chapter 2. We are starting a series this morning uh, called Suburban Detox, five weeks to cleanse your soul. We we talked about this scripture out of James that says, uh, religion that God our Father accepts as, as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. And we've spent quite a bit of time talking about vulnerable people and what our church does. But then it has the second part. So look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep yourself from being polluted by the world. And so this recognition that in the world in which we live has certain pollutions. The world is polluted. And and I'm not just talking all the environmental stuff of of today, but I'm saying there are pollutions. So whether you live in India or China or Iran, your context is different. But in suburban America, there are certain things that war against our soul. That, that, that pollute our soul. And so we're going to spend five weeks uh, recognizing some of them and saying, God, what would you have us do as your pastor? What I want, what I long for is for, for you and for us to have an authentic relationship with God and one another. A genuine, growing, maturing relationship with God where, where we're being discipled, where we're being transformed where we're growing in his will in our life and our understanding of seeing him and believing him and seeing him at work. And so recognizing some of these pollutants and then seeing what God has to say about it is is part of this leaning in, is taking steps forward. And this is also why we open the scriptures every every Sunday, that we gather together. And and I hope that you guys, that we take this, you know, we, we... we come in here, and this morning's, you know, we usually have the band and the drums, and, bah, 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 and it's louder, and there was something about this morning, even just a simple worship, God detox us from all the noise and all of the stuff, and let us just in a simple way, in a smaller way, focus in on you. And so, Lord, we come to worship every Sunday, and then communion, and then offering, and then we open the scriptures. Lord, form us, teach us, grow us. And I know some of us say, Matt, I don't even believe. I'm kind of just here checking the whole God thing out. And and this is a great and a safe place to do that. Also, you're going to hear, we are not... We're not hiding. We desire for you to know the Lord and to grow in the Lord and to grow in God and believe that Jesus has come and and given us life and offers to set us free. And so that's what we're about. So that's why we're going to open the scriptures. And that's, has anyone found Titus yet? (laughs) So we're going to Titus chapter 2. I've got it written out, so I don't even need to open my Bible. Verses 11 to 14, okay? We lean in, and here's what the scripture says for this morning. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. For the grace of God has appeared. What is the the grace of God has appeared? Who, Who are they talking about? Yeshua, that's a guy who knows that the the Jewish congregation's coming, Yeshua. That Jesus, the grace of God, Jesus has appeared. The grace of God, the undeserved gift, has appeared and offers salvation to all people. And we hear salvation, we say, oh yes, I have heard this, you know, that that in Jesus, he, he came and he died on the cross so that we can have eternal life, we can go to heaven. Salvation is eternal life, right? Eternal salvation, so we can be with God forever, which this is true. And he said, listen, that you can be with me, not in hell separated from me, in heaven with me. And this is eternal salvation. And the grace of God has appeared and offers this to all people. But it's also more than just where you go when you die. What happens when you leave this earth? Because look at how the scripture continues. It teaches us. This salvation working out in us, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives 
in this present age. The grace of God has appeared and it teaches us to say no to the ungodliness in our hearts. You know that part of you? You know that sin-stained part within you that, that desires your own selfish ways to, to, to justify yourself and your behavior? The, the, the sin-stained part. God, the, the grace of God that's appeared that offers salvation to everyone teaches us to say no to even the sin-stained parts within our lives and the worldly pollutions, the worldly passions and pollutions that press in all around us. The grace of God allows you to say no to that and to live in a different way and another way and a godly way because then we're able to live self-controlled. This word's gonna be big this morning. Self-controlled, upright, and godly lives today. Not, not in some other time, not when we leave this earth, but today, in this present age. The power of salvation at work to, to transform us today. Not just then, or not just later, but today. And while we experience this, and the truth of this, of God's salvation changing who we are, and, and the way we're able to respond and engage with the world around us, also, it is in part. We recognize it's not, y'all ain't perfect. Because look at how the, the scripture continues. It says, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait. While we wait. While we wait for the blessed hope. While we wait for something in which we hope but do not have yet which we see in part, but not in whole. While we wait for the blessed hope, what is that? The appearing, here's this word again, appearing, right? Remember, the grace of God has appeared. Okay, we said this is Jesus. Now you say, and, and it's allowed us to, in him we're able to deal with the ungodliness in the world around us and in our own hearts, but we're also waiting for something else, another appearing another appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Friends, the grace of God appeared, offers us a different way to live today, and we are a people still waiting. We wait for Jesus' return and the consummation or completion of all things that he has started. R remember, just, okay, just like take a breath. R remember this big picture. Th this big picture. This is the world that you see, which was absolutely wondrous this morning. Did, you, did anyone see the fog and the... And I'm telling you, going up yesterday, the men's retreat, driving up I-70 was like the most beautiful drive up I-70 I've ever had. At Mark Thompson and I went up, and it was 6 in the morning, and the, the clouds were lifting, and the sun's coming through, and the colors are like in their peak, and I'm just like, it was gorgeous. And, and, and the splendor of God, and the big picture that says, I created it. I created the world and everything in it. And I actually created you and humanity. You did not create yourself. I created you. And that I long to be in relationship with you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The God he says, I long to be in relationship with you. In fact, you were made to be in relationship with me. And in relationship with me is when you, when you figure out how to have right relationship with one another and right relationship within yourself. But something's gone wrong. And, and in chapter three of Genesis, we see that, that humanity said, yes, and this is how we're creative, and we're gonna go our own way. And, and we think we could do things our way, and that they broke this created design. And in this, we recognize God was not just an angry God, a wrathful God, or a God who's going to do the smackdown, although he's got that part of him. And he's a God of justice, 
but also he is a God of grace. And the grace appeared in what? In the person of Jesus. That God said, I so long to be in right relationship with the creation that I created and humanity and the people that I created that I'm actually going to enter in. That Jesus entered into the mess we had made. He created the world and then we made it a mess. And that he entered in and he took upon himself the punishment that we deserved. Just don't, God, may that not slip past us, but sink deep into us. The story of Scripture, the truth of Scripture, the narrative of Scripture, that God enters in and that the grace of God appears and offers salvation because he took the punishment upon himself on the cross. And then three days later, conquers death and and conquers the curse and and raises back to life. And he says, in me, this is possible. Life as it was created to be is possible in me because I have paid the price for you. So come to me and lay down your lives. Recognize for, for what you were created. And then Jesus ascends to be back with the Father, but then he sends his Holy Spirit. And for those of us who do lay our lives down, he says, listen, I've given you my spirit to to help transform you, to help convict you, to help compel you to to walk in my ways and and then be about my ways, be about my work on this earth. And this is the bigger picture. And he says, and guess what? One day I will return. Jesus will come back, and and he will come back, not not, not as the servant coming to take the punishment on himself, but but he's going to come back as as, as a warrior, and and he is going to to make all things right, but he's going to gather together everyone. He says, okay, who are those who are in me, and who are those who are outside? Who are those who have received me, and who are those who have rejected me? And for those who reject him... They will be separated from him. But those who have bent to knee and said, yeah, we recognize, God, that in you is life. That we will be with him forever. And he will make all things right. In the book of Revelation, the last one says, he will wipe every tear. The completion. What we've been longing for and what humanity has been longing for that was lost in the Garden of Eden. He will make right and make whole again. He gave himself for us to redeem us, to purify us for himself, and then to compel and empower us to do what is good. Right behavior is a result of right relationship. And he came to make right relationship. So Matt, I thought you said like we were talking about like some pollutions and like suburban detox and... uh, what are you asking us to detox from? What's the suburban thing? The suburban pollutant that I'm addressing and that we're addressing this morning is control. We live in an environment that tells us you can control it. You are in control of your lives. You can make things happen. You are large and in charge, baby. Right? Just buy our stuff and and, and man, you got it. And control is this huge foundation. It almost seems like what it is to sort of be American in a way, is to be in control. And I can vote for who I want to. I can graduate from where I want to. I can make as much as I want to because I'm in control. I can marry who I want to. I can do what I want to. No one's saying amen right now. (laughs) In your lives, when you try to play God, you will lose. Period. Control is one of the biggest means of playing God. You are in control, you have control. Now, there's a tension, 
And, and I want to recognize this tension really uh, obviously and honestly. There's a tension because you say, okay, but Matt, what is God's responsibility and what is my responsibility? Because guess what? We do have responsibility. We have responsibility. Like you say, okay, uh, Matt, the Bible says that God is my provider. But guess what? I get up every morning at six o'clock and go to work and get the paycheck and come home and work my tail off and, and I'm really disciplined in it. So is God my provider or am I my provider? It, it, what's his responsibility and what's my responsibility? Or maybe it says, hey, Matt, scriptures say that God is like healer, um, but I never exercise. I eat horribly and I drink a lot of beer. And God's like failing me, man, because my health is like, you know, is that God's responsibility or is that my responsibility? Scripture says that, that Jesus, you are our peace. And, and so if I'm experiencing anxiety or excessive stress, God, is that because you are not who the Bible says you are? Or, or is that because of some kind of wrong belief or misplaced loyalty within myself? God, what's my responsibility and what's your responsibility? I, I love the scripture, I didn't put it on the board, but 2 Timothy 1.7 um, says this. It said, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Okay? I'm not giving you this this morning what you're going to hear, and you got to take away. This isn't, hey, sit around and be lazy. God's in control. Just, just lay down and, and, you know, watch some Netflix. God, you gave us a spirit not of timidity, but of power and of love and of self-discipline. So I'm going to give you the answer to this tension. God, what is your responsibility and what is mine? What are you in control of, God, and what are you not? What's a right perspective of, can I need to take responsibility and, and even some control in my life and, and do some things, you know? And, and, and God, I need to not try and take your seat and your spot and total control. So I'm going to share, you know, I love it. Like, let me show you another one. I'm just getting all these good ones right here, like God's downloading them to me. I don't know if I can claim that, but I'm getting some good ideas. God, I'm not growing in my faith. I, I go to church like once a month, Lord. What's going on? I never really open the Bible and read it on my own. It's hard, God. You don't understand. The thing's kind of hard to understand. I'm not growing spiritually, Lord. Is that God's deal or your deal? Is that his responsibility or yours? And who failed? What's going on there? So I'm going to share with you, and I, I, this is some, okay, I passed all those things out. I want one now, though. Can, um, I, uh, I pass these out, and I, I've got two graphs here. And these graphs, I did not create them. They come from um, a book called How People Grow, by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. They're these Christian counselors. They've done all kinds of work on boundaries, and they're just, I really appreciate this first, this framework that they've laid out here, and so I wanted to share it with you kind of as a tool and, and a uh, thing. I don't have a good word. <laughs> so, something to help you understand this. Okay, when we go, and it's in three acts, let's go back to creation. Remember when I said, and, and I share this, I said, when we go to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see that God created the world and everything in the world, and that he created it with certain order and structure, and then he created us, and he placed us in the world that he created, that God is the creator, and he's laid things out. And so in this first, uh, in this first graph up here, it says there's some responsibilities that are of God's by his design, and there are some responsibilities of people. God is the source. We depend on him. God is the creator. We are the creation. We do not exist unto ourselves. God has control of the world. 
we have control of ourselves. God is the judge of life, and we experience life. That's a great one, man. We could talk about that. He is the judge, and we experience it. We are not created to judge it. God designed life and its rules. We obey the rules, and in that framework, then live the life that God designed, which is the best life, right? The car runs better on the gas it was created to run on. But then there's the fall, and that humanity decided to go away different than what they were created. And, and these fallen desires and the results, I, I want you to look at these same five uh, areas of what God has created us for, and look what we've done to it. Instead of God being the source, our fallen desires, our broken desires, we begin to say, we are the source. So we have to depend on ourselves. Pull ourselves by, up by our own bootstraps, because we made our boots too. We are the creator. We exist unto ourselves. And I suspect none of us would say that, or our culture probably would not say that, but that is, when you get down to it, that is what we are believing and how we act and how the world around us is telling us to act. That you are the creator, you exist unto yourselves. That we have control of the world. And so what we try and do, because we can control it, we're masterful at controlling it. So what we try and do is we try and control our world and each other. Oh man, we love to control each other. Our spouse, our kids, our employer, or those who work under us. And what happens? What happens when we try and control that which we were never created to control? We lose control of the one thing we are created to control, and that's ourselves. Many of us have experienced this, and many of us, all of us know people. You try so hard to control the things you cannot control, and what ends up happening is you lose the ability to even control yourself. You get overwhelmed. We become the judge of life. And then we judge ourselves and each other and cease to be able to experience ourselves and each other. When we have to go around as a judge, we're judging and checking everything out. So we don't just experience in a freedom, we're judging everything and placing it and we're judging ourselves. And did I show up good enough there? Did I do a good enough job? Did I, sh oh, I shouldn't have said that. I should have said this and I, no. God, you are the judge, and we just seek to. That's what Tyler said. God, in you are all the answers. And sometimes when we try and be the judge and take your place, man, it, it steals life. And then we believe that we design life and the rules. So we, we live in any way we want. Friends, we live in a culture that says we make the rules we design it how we want, and then we live any way we want. Anytime you try and play God, you will lose. Anytime you go outside of the design that God has created, you will suffer harm. It will hurt you or your society. One of the biggest lies that come at us is you are in control. You are a little God. And so then when we read that the grace of God has appeared and offers salvation to all people, we, we, what happens then is that salvation, we enter into it, and, and it's got to reverse back. God, we go from our fallen state, separated from you, where we try and be our own little gods, and, and we buy into what our culture tries to sell us, and we have to recognize it and then return to the, to the way you made it. God, the way that you have created things to be. God, that you are the source, you are the creator, you have control of the world, I have control of myself. A fruit of the Spirit, that's a result of being connected with the Spirit of God, is self-control. That's the one thing you can control. God, help us to be able to control ourselves and how we respond or don't respond, how we act or don't act, what we say or don't say. Self-control. In that scripture, in, in, in Timothy or uh, Titus chapter 2, 
Four times it, talks, it says self-control. Self-control, self-control. Don't try, don't try, you try to control the world, you lose control of yourself. God, help us know what we have control over and what we don't. You are in control of the world, God, not us. God, you are the judge of life and you design life and its rules. That's the answer. When you struggle, God, what's my responsibility and what's yours? Don't, don't try, don't recognize this, our cultural tendency and our sin-stained human, humanity tendency to play God and to be in control of things we have no right and, and we actually have no ability to be in control of. The grace of God that appears offers salvation to all and he offers to bring us back to how we were created to live. So every week I want to give you a uh, sort of a spiritual practice or something you could do because oftentimes you say, okay, Matt, uh, I'm going to work really hard on not being in control. I'm going to try and control my not being in control. And I'm like, yeah, that's probably not the best way to go about this. Because that's often what we would honestly do, right? I, I wonder this. And now let me, um, let me step on your toes, maybe. I'll just step on your toes. I wonder how much of our prayers are actually an attempt to control God. To get the outcome we want and the things we want. God, there are, there, there are many places where God's like, yeah, when you get together and you worship, when you all get down and you pray together for me, I don't even hear it. What, are you trying to control me again? You're not coming to me as God. You're coming to me as genie in the bottle trying to get what you want. You're trying to use your little control thing against me, the creator of the universe. Doesn't work like that. God, why don't you answer my prayers? Okay? So here's, here's what I want to challenge us with this week. You know what's really hard to do? Watch, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. This is really hard to do. Nothing. Hey, Lord, I'm, I just, I'm going to be quiet for like five minutes. I'm not going to give you my list of what I need. I, although I might, and I would love, and it would be good, Lord, maybe you've given me a scripture or something. But even at some point, I'm going to say, Lord, this is who you are, and this is what you spoke to me, but also, but then I'm just going to. I'm going to be still. And, and I'm going to feel some of my control. I'm going I'm to want to grab it and do something with it. I'm going to say, no. God, I want to sit still before you. Maybe prayer goes both ways. And God, I haven't sat still enough to even hear you. And so my challenge for us this week, my challenge for you, I, I pray that the Lord pointed out some places in your life where you try and control that which you have no business or ability to control. Where you try to play God. And in that, we repent. We say, Lord, I'm sorry. 
this is not, this is why it's not working. God, you didn't design it to work this way. You designed me to let go of this and to trust you in this and then to do the things to control myself and, and the things I can. So Spirit of God, come in. And then we're going to say, you know what? I'm just going to sit in silence. The spiritual discipline of solitude or silence. Five minutes. Some of you guys are like monsters. You can do like 10 or 15. I'm going more on my level. Five minutes. A couple times. I don't know. Maybe God's convicting you. You say, you know what? I'm going to do it every day this week. I'm not giving God my list. I'm going to crucify my tendencies of control. And I'm going to sit with God saying, Lord, your presence. Your presence. And let him work. There's something really refreshing about that. Uh, so, Father, I, I sit in this chair right now. And it's the chair that we were created for. It's not that we don't have responsibility it's not that we don't have discipline. It's not that we don't beat our bodies at times, Lord, and that, that we don't have commitment. We're not looking for the easy way here, Lord, but we are recognizing we tend to go into places that are not ours to go into. And we try and control our environment, and God, we try and control you. And then we suffer the consequence of it. And so we repent from it. And Lord, I pray that this week uh, we would have the discipline to not just maybe hear something that sounds like a good idea in a sermon, but to actually follow through. Lord, right now, if we're serious and that we're going to take some time to sit in solitude and silence this week, we're going to make that commitment just between, just between us and you. Right now, church, if that's, say it to the Lord, what you're going to do. Because, Lord, we want to commit to sitting in the seat that you've created us to sit in. Oh, it's such a relief that we don't have to control the world. <laughs> we don't have to control our spouse, our family members. God, we're not in control that things that we are really struggling with right now. Lord, we need you. Jesus, you are the grace of God who has appeared and offers salvation and life. In you, we are able to, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. To live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Amen. Hey, let's have our awesome two-person worship band come up and uh, close us in, in some praise to the Lord together. Amen.